You know, I've lost track of how many times I've said it. There is more than one way to skin a cat in Darktable. And when it comes to correcting colour, nothing could be further from the truth. And this week we're going to look at a module called Colour Balance. As the name would suggest, it's there to help you balance the colour. <laughs> Let's have a look at it. Hi, and welcome to episode 42, take two, because I accidentally deleted the first take. I'm going to have a go at describing the colour balance module. Now, I've looked at this in depth in preparation for doing this video and in recording the video the first time. And sadly, I have to say that the online documentation for this module doesn't really cover everything that's in the module. Uh, it's one of those instances where, you know, we need more thorough documentation and I've got enough on my plate, so I'm sorry I'm not putting my hand up for that right now. We are going to start with this image of Tegan. It's another one of the images that I shot on our Autumn Colours shoot a couple of weeks ago. And as you can see, I haven't really done a whole lot here. Took it back to the original state, gave the white balance a slight tweak, gave the tone curve just a little bit of a S-curve just to give it some contrast. And that is all I've done. I had a framing module there that I'm not using at the moment. So let's jump on over to the color balance module. Now, it's quite a daunting looking module. There is quite a lot here. And we start with a drop down menu that offers three different options. Lift Gamma and Gain in Profoto RGB color space. The default, which is slope, offset, and power in Profoto RGB, and then a lift gamma and gain in sRGB color space. Now, I understand the basics of color spaces. I'm sure there are people with a much greater technical understanding who could probably describe it a lot better than I could. What I understand is that things like Profoto RGB and Adobe RGB offer the ability to work with a greater range of colors than a smaller color space like sRGB. Now you might wonder, well, why do we need a smaller color space like sRGB? Well, the reality is that most computer monitors and the way things are displayed on the web is all sRGB. It uses a smaller gamut of colors. And when we say gamut, we basically mean a range of viewable or editable colors. So the first two options offer the ability to work in Profoto RGB. And like I said, that is a larger color space. Now you're probably thinking, well, if I'm going to export my images to sRGB at the end, why don't I just work in sRGB? And I'm going to bring in an analogy from my other life which is 30 plus years as a professional audio engineer. And I understand you guys are not audio engineers, but I'm sure you'll understand the, the correlation here. In an audio sense, when we talk about working through a production workflow, we're talking about the recording of the various elements of a piece of audio. So if you're working with a band, say, you know, it'd be various drum tracks and guitar tracks and bass tracks and vocals and keyboards and all, all of those things are production elements. What we want to do during an audio production workflow is work with the highest quality assets that we can right through to the end of the production workflow to the point where we're ready to deliver the final mixed product to whatever end destination it's going to. So from an audio standpoint, we want to work with the highest sample rate that we can, and we want to work with the greatest bit depth. Now, I don't want to get into a massive audio explanation of what those things mean, but I think there's a correlation between that and image editing. So the idea is you want to work with the widest range of colors that you can for as long as you can through your production workflow so that when you get to an image that is ready to deliver, you've still got this massive range of colors and tones, but 
if you know that you're going to deliver to some sort of delivery mechanism that can only handle that range of colors and tones, then you can allow whatever tool is doing the job, and in our case it's Darktable, you can then let it work out what's the best approach for taking this big range of colors and tones and squashing it down into a smaller delivery medium. Okay, I feel like I'm getting off the track here and I've always promised I wouldn't do that. But I did want to just sort of run through why you would work in a larger color space than sRGB if you had that option. So I don't know what the difference is between slope offset power and lift gamma and gain. I mean, I know what lift gamma and gain are because in the video world, they talk about that. Lift refers to your shadows, gamma refers to your midtones, and gain refers to your highlights. So I understand that, but what slope offset and power do, I don't really know. And it's one of those areas that's not covered in the help manual on the darktable.org link for this particular module. So having said all that, I'm just going to leave it on the default, which is slope, offset, and power in the Profoto RGB color space. The next thing we've got is the color control sliders. Now there are three options here, hue, saturation, and lightness, red, green, and blue, and lightness, or luminosity, you can take your pick on what the L stands for, or both. Now, the default is hue, saturation, and lightness. And it means that the module looks like this. But if you look at the screenshot, which is included on the help page in your web browser, you will see that the screenshot actually looks like this, where you've got the RGB slider. So it's that screenshot was taken with this drop down set to RGBL. So if you do notice that the screenshot looks different to the module when you open up the module, that's probably why, because the module now defaults to hue, saturation, and lightness, or luminosity. Okay, so moving on, we've got these four sliders here, input saturation and output saturation. Should be fairly simple. Why would we want to adjust those? Well, Let's suppose that we know that once we get down here to these other sliders, we are going to increase the saturation of pixels within our image, then we might want to reduce the input saturation before the module actually starts doing what we're asking it to do so that we're not driving pixels into out of gamut values by the end of the module. Likewise, if we knew we were going to be desaturating certain pixels, you know, with these sliders down here, we might want to increase the input saturation just so we've still got something to work with when we start dragging sliders around all over the place. And the output saturation works in much the same way. It's there to act as a compensation for anything you might have done with the module at the output stage. You know, so you've done things in the module and you know, maybe you've increased saturation and so therefore you need to drag the output saturation down a little bit. Now, like I said, because we're working in the Profoto RGB color space, we're probably okay because it can handle a wider range of colors and tones. Okay, moving on. Contrast fulcrum. A fulcrum is basically a pivot point. So if we were to think of our tone curve, I've got a spare tone curve module here. If we introduce a point like so, that point there is a fulcrum. Because if we introduce another point and drag it around all over the place, the curve will change in between those pivot points, but those pivot points remain fixed hence the term a fulcrum, right? So those points remain fixed and everything around them will change. So we'll just undo that. We'll jump back to here. So a contrast fulcrum suggests to me, and again, this is not covered in the help manual, so I'm only going on my understanding of these terminologies, is that this is allowing us to say, this is the point 
in the luminosity, I'm assuming it's luminosity, at 18%, that point will remain fixed and any contrast we add will happen above and below that point. But that 18% point will remain fixed. And if you understand your exposure theory, you know, where we talk about 18% grey as being, you know, our target for exposure, it kind of makes sense that that's why 18% is the default. And then we've got the contrast control, which, if I understand it correctly, because again, it's not covered in the help manual, this would be basically saying, how steep do you want this slope to be? Do you want it quite steep and super contrasty, or do you want it to be quite shallow, like so, where it's only applying a little bit of contrast? Now, again, that is just my guess based on what I'm seeing. Okay, with all of those caveats in place, we can move on. We now see that what we've got is four sliders for the shadows, another four sliders for the midtones, and another four sliders for the highlights. And again, devs, I've got to ask the question, why are shadows at the top and highlights at the bottom? Is it just me? Or, you know, my mind says shadows are down the bottom and highlights are up the top. I, nah, whatever. Okay, so what we've got, because we are in RGBL mode here, is we've got a slider that goes between cyan and red, another slider that goes between magenta and green, and another slider that goes between yellow and blue. So we can adjust the color balance just for the shadows using these three sliders. And then we've got the same three sliders so that we can adjust the color of just the midtones. And then we've got another three so that we can adjust the color of only the highlights. And then in each of these cases, the factor control, it's basically like one big volume knob. It's like turn it up or turn it down. So let's have a go. This image, I've really done nothing to the color at this point. It's pretty much the way it came out of the camera. Yes, I did marginally tweak the white balance. It came out at about 5700K and I've manually set it to 5600K. So it's not a massive shift. Okay, let's suppose that what we wanted to do with this image was go for that teal and orange look that is all the rage in the world of cinematography right now, right? Everyone's going gaga over that look and I'm, I'm calling it now. 10, 20 years from now, we're going to look back on this point in time and go, oh my God, that look was so overdone. Everybody was doing it and it ruined every movie that came out, <laughs> you know. Anyway, let's suppose that's what we wanted to do. So what we would do is we'd go, okay, well, we want some of that nice, rich blue in the shadows. So we'll grab this and we'll drag it to the right. And as you can see, you don't have to drag far on these sliders for things to get really out of control very quickly. So we've got our blues, but it's kind of washed the image out. So what we would do then is grab the factor and just drag that down a bit. See what I mean? Like it's a volume control. It's like make it all darker or make it all even lighter. So we want to bring it right down so that we're getting some nice solid color there, but we don't want to clip stupid amounts. Okay, so now we've got these deep blues in our shadows. If we weren't happy with that, we might want to introduce a bit of cyan as well, although that might tend towards going a bit greenish. Well, actually, that's not too bad. So we just go that little bit of cyan there. So now we've got our really deep blues in the shadows. And I feel like it has affected a little bit of Tegan in this shot. So maybe what we want to do is really push the oranges in 
the mid-range and the highlights. So orange would be a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow. So we'll go for a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow. And that's kind of going the way we want it to go. Might just go a little bit more extreme. And yeah, that's probably a little too far to be honest. Let's just bring it back a bit. In terms of factor, we can go darker, we can go lighter, and it really, you know, once again, just comes down to your personal aesthetic and the image that you are working on. I know I say this almost every video. Okay, highlights. Do we really need to do anything with the highlights? I actually don't feel like I do. I think the tones here in the scarf are pretty much where I want them to be. Uh, maybe I want to introduce a little bit of yellow to it. Maybe, maybe something like that. And maybe just lighten it up a little bit. I'm actually feeling like the mid-tones are a little too dark now. I'm just going to bring those up a bit. Okay, so that's just one approach to using the color balance module. Now, so far, we've only looked at the RGBL color control sliders. So let's reset the whole module and let's jump back to the hue, saturation and luminosity or hue, saturation and lightness mode and see what works differently. So we'll click on reset. We're back to our original image. We are again back in HSL and we will start the process all over again. So we want to go for that sort of teal look. So we just bring our hue slider up to somewhere around where we think it needs to be. Again, we're just going visually here. And then we can just introduce some saturation. Ooh, I'm actually liking this better. Maybe that's why it defaults to this mode. I actually think that's a much better teal than what I had before. Again, it needs to be a little darker. Oh, oh, that's looking great. Okay, if that's the look you're going for. Okay, so mid-tones, we want to bring up some of that orange. So we'll just go up here to our orange, and then we'll bring in some saturation. And yeah, that's our teal and orange cinematic look all over. Uh, factor is probably pretty good. Maybe just wants to lift up a little bit. Now, previously I tried putting a little bit of yellow into the highlight, so let's just do that. I actually think that's probably enough. So there we go. Those are the two different approaches with the color control sliders. Now, the both option simply gives you all five sliders in all three luminosity ranges, the shadows, the mids, and the highlights. But it's not like you can use all five of them together because if you use the hue and saturation, you will see the RGB sliders move for themselves. Likewise, if you move any of the RGB sliders, you will find that the hue and saturation sliders will move for themselves as well. So if I was to grab this particular slider here, you can see that the hue and saturation are responding in kind. So that's that. These eyedroppers down the right hand side, these are available regardless of which color control slider option you've got chosen there. We'll just go back to hue, saturation and luminosity. What they do is essentially an auto mode for the factor or for the hue based on what Darktable sees in the image. So if I was to click on the eyedropper for the shadows factor, I'm currently at minus 3.27%. What will happen is Darktable will, oh, it was there and then it disappeared. That was weird. There it is, it's back. What we get is this gray box. Now, if you've ever done custom white balance in the white balance module, you will have seen this gray box before. Basically, 
Darktable is measuring the value of all the pixels inside this box and determining that it thinks the factor should actually be at minus 0.37. Now you are not restricted only to where this box defaults. You can left click and drag. If you want to use a particular portion of the image to gain a starting point. So if you wanted to say, I just want to work on these shadows over here in the background, we actually get minus 3.02, which is much closer to where I was at, what was I, minus 3.27, I think. So as you can see, depending on which part of the image is being read, Darktable will come up with different values. And the same goes for the hue and you know, all the other things. So basically those eyedroppers work as an automatic mode to give you an idea of where Darktable thinks your starting point should be. Take all of it with a grain of salt. You know, at the end of the day, this is subjective. It's your art. It's your image. It comes down to what you want to do and the, the look that you want to create. Down the bottom here, we've got two more options that are also not covered in the help manual. Optimize Luma, Luma being our luminosity, and neutralize colors. So optimize Luma, now you'll see by the heading, auto optimizers. So basically, these are just one click buttons that you have no further control of. And once you've clicked them, you can't do an undo as best as I can tell, other than going back and changing the values on all of your sliders again. So let's go with Optimize Luma and see what Darktable thinks of the luminosity of our image as it stands. It's really lightened it up and in my opinion, way too much. But, you know, it's up to you. So I'm just going to dial that right back down again and that can probably come down as well. As for neutralized colors, I was a little skeptical of this because I thought, is it going to undo where I've tried to go with the teal and orange look? Well, I'm happy to say no. Click on that. And it's pretty much kept the, the teal and orange look, although it did shift it a little bit and I feel like it's made the whole image a little bit darker. So I'd probably then want to go back in and tweak, you know, levels or luminosities. But anyway, that is my take on the color balance module. Like I said, the help page is sorely deficient in information on this module. It covers just the very basics, but it doesn't cover a lot of this extra content. I'm wondering if it is a case that this module has been expanded since its original implementation, but the help manual has not been updated to feature those new controls or, you know, defaults or whatever. Just my guess. Like I said, I'm only going on my understanding of all of these things based on prior learning. Uh, I might be completely up the tree with some of it and if I am my apologies if you have anything to add if you have experience either that you were involved in the development of the module or you have a better understanding of the theory behind this stuff please do sing out in the comments down below you know I'm always open to discussion uh, and I think it's great that we can share our knowledge and you know help other users along okay I think that is pretty much it for the module. Obviously, you've got your blend options down the bottom, but we've covered that ad infinitum on previous videos. So, you know, if you did want to limit the color balancing that you were doing to only a certain portion of the image, you could do that. You know, so that kind of makes me think back to my episode on white balance, where, you know, you might have two different white balances within the one image because, you know, maybe there was a tungsten light and a fluorescent light in the same shot or, you know, a tungsten light and a flash. Uh, and so you get these wildly different 
white balances in certain regions of your image, then you might want to use the color balance module. I don't know why, but you might. You could use the white balance module, but this particular module, the color balance module, does give you a lot more nuance, shall we call it. You know, much more control can be had in this module once you understand what it's designed to do. And I will confess that up until now, I've never used it because I initially just looked at it and went, what? Got no idea what I'm doing with that. And that's why I've stayed away from it up until now. Now that I've sort of looked into it and I've had a play with it, kind of got a bit of an understanding for what it's doing, I can see myself potentially using this module going forward. All right. That's going to do it. I don't think I had anything to add. Uh, You may have noticed slightly different camera angle in this episode. Last weekend, I took my softbox out uh, because I did a studio shoot down in the garage. And I don't know if it's something about the way I've set it up that I've just not got it at the right or the same angle as I had it before. But I did notice that when I started recording, uh, well, my first attempt at doing this video, which was yesterday... Uh, in my normal position, which is a little bit over to this way, I was getting a reflection of the softbox on my glasses and it was really annoying. And I thought if it's annoying me, it's probably annoying other people. So I've just changed things around a little bit. I normally have camera here and then microphone here and I've sort of swapped them around. So microphone is there. Okay. (laughs) You probably didn't care, but I just thought I'd mention it. So if you were wondering why things have changed, that's why. All right, I think that's going to do it. Again, any comments, questions, feedback, please sing out in the comments down below. And I'll catch you in the next one.